So today we're going to be talking about um, Virginia Woolf some more, and in this lecture we're going to be looking at Slater's Pins Have No Point um, from a collection <coughs> of fiction called Moments of Being. Um, so I had never read this before, and I found this story very difficult. Um, I don't know if you guys also found it difficult, but um, I think a main thing to notice about this story is that like nothing happens really in it. Um, so the like action of the story is just um, Fanny looking for a pin. So she dropped a pin and now she's looking for it and that's the whole story. Um, and so it's written in the style of stream of consciousness. Um, so that is a literary style in which a character's thoughts, feelings, and reactions are depicted in a continuous flow, uninterrupted by objective description or conventional, conventional dialogue. Um, and Virginia Woolf is one of the like most notable people who used this technique early on. Um, and this was a very important technique to a lot of modernists because um, as we talked about when we talked about like what modernism did, modernist fiction was really interested in like interrupting um, the usual like narrative flow of fiction. Um, so this idea of like okay like story starts, there's like a rising action, there's like a climax, a falling action, and then like a denouement. Um, stream of consciousness doesn't necessarily provide that in the way that you would expect, um, and. So as you can see, we have this story in which the actual action, like in the physical world, is almost nothing. It's literally just a woman looking for a pin that she dropped on the ground. But the psychological action of the story is where everything happens and it's what matters. So as we know, modernists were like living in a world where um, Freud had just sort of started publishing um, and people were really rethinking what the psychological landscape looked like and in particular were being told that their personalities actually depended a lot on these like repressed sexual impulses um, that they had but could often not get in touch with on a conscious level. So that's sort of what's happening in this story. Um, so this is a story about Fanny um, like thinking about her teacher but for the most part she's unable to recognize her erotic attraction to her teacher. So um, Fanny is a lesbian and is, you know, obsessing over Miss Cray or Julia Cray's sort of like romantic history throughout the story, but she can't quite get to a place of understanding how she actually feels about Fanny. So this is really a story about like repression. Um, all right, so we'll just go through like the text itself a little bit. So it begins with the phrase, Slater's pins have no point. Don't you always find that? Said Miss Cray, turning around as the rose fell out of Fanny Wilmot's dress, and Fanny stooped with her ears full of the music to look for the pin on the floor. So she's at a music lesson, and the pin has um, fallen from her dress. So the pin has literally deflowered Fanny Wilmot, um, but it's shown as a kind of, so the pin is phallic, um, and is shown as this like impotent uh, vision of masculinity, I guess, because it has no point, like it can't do what it's supposed to do. Um, and the flower is Yonic. So the flower is a feminine symbol and the pin is a masculine symbol. And um, that becomes especially important when Fanny is like sitting in the chair holding the flower. Um, and, or when Julia is sitting and holding the flower, sorry. And Fanny um, almost like feels her touch on the flower. So all of the erotic action of this story is very much like coded with symbols um, and is repressed on the conscious level. So they begin sort of, well, 
She begins looking for the pin. <clears throat> um, the words give her an extraordinary shock because for Fanny, she's never really imagined that Julia could be just like a regular person, that she would just like go to the store, um, go to Slater's, buy these pins. Um, because Julia Cray seemed to her to live in the cool, glassy world of box fugues, playing to herself what she liked and only consenting to take one or two pupils at the Archer Street College of Music, um, so the principal, Miss Kingston, said as a special favor to herself, who had, quote, the greatest admiration for her in every way. Miss Cray was left badly off, Miss Kingston was afraid, at her brother's death. Um, so we know that Fanny is alone, <coughs> or, <coughs> sorry, my allergies are killing me today, um, not necessarily alone, she has um, the principal there who she may be in a romantic relationship with. Some of the criticism I've read said that that's what's going on. Um, I, I'm not sure that's like there in the text, but I, I mean, it's not not there either. Like it makes sense. Um, but there are no men in her life. Like she's definitely a spinster. She's not married and her brother is no longer living. So she has no real like male influence around. And Fanny sees her as someone who lives this kind of sheltered and almost like ideal sort of life in which she wouldn't have to do things that regular people would have to do, like go buy pins. Um, and so we sort of slip into Miss Kingston's description of Julia, um, that she had been a tomboy, um, that the craze were not used to children. So a lot of this is just kind of like Fanny thinking about what Miss Cray is like. So Fanny is Miss Wilmot, Fanny Wilmot, and Julia is Miss Cray, Julia Cray, which is part of why the story is confusing. It's also kind of confusing because Wolf just like uses a lot of pronouns without clarifying who they refer to. So I feel like it can get kind of tricky to know who's talking. Um, so I mean, you kind of got to go back to like gr basic grammar and just keep in mind that a pronoun should <coughs> should always refer to the noun that was closest to it. So whatever is the closest noun before you get the pronoun, that's who it should be referring to. Um, okay. So, on page 234, um, we see Fanny kind of thinking about Julia's brother, um, whose name is Julius. So he's almost like the male, I mean, he is like the male equivalent of Julia Cray. Um, and one sort of, uh, like article that I read about this story, um, it's by Susan Clemens and it's sort of about like repressed queer desire in the story. And this author claims that <clears throat> um, the way that Fanny thinks about Julius is a way of taking her desire for her teacher and mapping it onto a heterosexual object. So basically, if she can have her desire be toward Julius and not toward Julia, it's not necessarily does it make it more societally acceptable in this situation, but actually it's more understandable for herself like fanny cannot understand her own desire for julia so instead she kind of um she like deflects it onto her brother so on page 234 <coughs> on page 234 we see um <coughs> um One could have sworn, thought Fanny Wilmot, as she looked for the pin, that at parties, meetings, Miss Kingston's father was a clergyman, she had picked up some piece of gossip, or it might have only been a smile or a tone when his name was mentioned, which had given her a feeling about Julius Cray. Needless to say, she had never spoken about it to anybody. Probably she scarcely knew what she meant by it, but whenever she spoke of Julius or heard him mentioned, that was the first thing that came to mind. 
and it was a seductive thought. There was something odd about Julius Cray. So she can't quite even, like, understand exactly what it is that she feels toward Julius. So a lot of the story is about, like, how Fanny is coming to recognize herself as um, having desires and being, like, a person who desires. Um, and keep in mind, like, in Professions for Women, Wolf wrote very explicitly, or talked very explicitly, about how difficult it was to write about erotic desire as a woman. So she does so through this kind of coded, like, symbolism and, um, like, I guess, this repression. So Fanny doesn't know how she feels about Julius Cray. Um, I guess Oscar's going to be in our lecture today. And so right after she says there was something odd about Julius Cray, we get into one of the most um, erotic moments of the story. So this is the bottom of 234. Um, so here Fanny starts to observe Julius. Um, and she's sort of thinking about beauty. It was so that Julia looked to as she sat half turned on the music stool smiling. It's on the field, it's on the pane, it's in the sky. Beauty. And I can't get at it. I can't have it. I, she seemed to add, with that little clutch of the hand, which was so characteristic, who adore it so passionately, would give the whole world to possess it. And she picked up the carnation, which had fallen on the floor, while Fanny searched for the pin. She crushed it, Fanny felt, voluptuously, in her smooth, veined hand, stuck about with water-colored rings set in pearls. The pressure of her fingers seemed to increase all that was most brilliant in the flower, to set it off, to make it more frilled, fresh, immaculate. What was odd in her, and perhaps in her brother too, <clears throat> was that their, this crush and grasp of the finger was combined with a perpetual frustration. So it was even now with the carnation. She had her hands on it, she pressed it, but she did not possess it, enjoy it, not entirely and altogether. So, um, we move immediately from Fanny's sense that there's something odd about Julius Cray to her, who, who is dead, um, to her realization that there is perhaps the same odd thing, the same unnameable attraction um, in Julia Cray. So Julia is holding this flower. The flower belongs to Fanny. It's the flower that the pin could not hold onto her dress. Um, and we see Fanny observing her touching it. Um, but all of this is kind of like in Fanny's mind. So Fanny is a first person limited narrator. We only get her perceptions. We're like viewing this whole story through the lens of her, um, what's, what's conscious in her psyche. And, um, she imagines Julia thinking about beauty and thinking to herself that it's something that she can almost possess, but not quite, right? Um, and is trying to possess by holding and Fanny feels crushing the flower. So there's this sense that Fanny can like physically experience Julia's touch on the flower. Um, so definitely a moment of repressed eroticism here. So then, um, on page 235, Fanny remembers that none of the Crays had ever married, and that Julia had once said to her, it's the use of men, surely, to protect us. Um, and then follows up with that, that it's the only use of men. And Fanny says to her, I don't want protection. So there, there, there is this level on which Fanny does seem to be conscious of, like, not wanting a man in her life, um, but she can't quite get at why yet. Um, and she's, she's young too, right? I think she's like a teenager. She's her piano student, so. Um, so men have only one use, and it is to protect women. And these women seem not to necessarily need protection, and they don't have any men in their lives. Um, and I also think it's 
interesting to note kind of the subtext here because like what can men protect women from? Mostly other men. Um, so although it's the only use of men, it's also like men who necessitate that in the first place. And so then on the middle of page 235, um, we see Fanny really go on this kind of like imaginative tangent in which she starts thinking about Julia's um, life when she was younger. Um, and specifically, like why she never married and, you know, what she might have said to marriage proposals. So she's starting like really imagining these proposals to her teacher. So keep in mind, none of these things ever like happened. This is all just Fanny imagining what might have happened. It's not what actually happened. Um, and Fanny's obsession with like, you know, Julia's romantic past is another clue that like she has romantic and erotic feelings for her that she can't quite put a name to. Um, okay. And notice how she describes her too. Like she definitely describes her in this way that's very like, she, she sees her as beautiful. Um, one could imagine every sort of scene in her youth, when with her good blue eyes, her straight firm nose, her air of cool distinction, her piano playing, her rose flowering with chaste passion in the bosom of her muslin dress, she had attracted first the young men to whom such things, the china teacups and the silver candlesticks and the inlaid table, for the craze had such nice things, were wonderful, young men not sufficiently distinguished, young men of the cathedral town with ambitions. She had attracted them first, and then her brother's friends from Oxford or Cambridge, they would come down in the summer, row her on the river, continue the argument about Browning by letter, and arrange perhaps on the rare occasions when she stayed in London to show her Kensington Gardens, much the nicest part of London, Kensington. I'm speaking of 15 or 20 years ago, she had said once. Um, one was in the gardens in 10 minutes, in the heart of the country. So, um, Fanny imagines this one specific guy, Mr. Sherman, um, taking her to tr tea, that they had looked at the serpentine, he had rowed her around, um, and that he had decided to propose, but couldn't because she interrupted. Um, he would have them into the bridge, she cried. It was a moment of horror, or of disillusionment, of revelation for both of them. So in Fanny's imagination, he's about to propose, but actually is almost going to hit the bridge with the boat. And then uh, Julia cries out that he needs to stop because he's gonna, he's gonna crash the boat. Um, I can't have it, I can't possess it, she thought. He could not see why she had come then. With a great splash of his oar, he pulled the boat round. Merely to snub him, he rowed her back and said goodbye to her. The setting of that scene could be varied as one shows, Fanny will not reflect it. So in Fanny's imagination, she thinks to herself while she's being proposed to, I can't have it, I can't possess it. And that, um, that picks up on what Fanny was imagining Julia thinking about the flower too, which is that beauty is something that she loves and wants but like can't actually have or possess. Um, and part of this is, I mean, this is just Fanny like sort of reflecting her own, her own repressed psyche onto Julia. So it's not maybe that Julia can't possess these things, but that Fanny herself is too unable to recognize and name her own desire to possess the kind of beauty that she wants to possess, so to be with a woman. Um, and then we have more on like why, I'm going to get rid of Oscar, he's just being a little annoying. All right, I'm going to, um, okay, so if you look here, um, all right, we're going to look at the middle to bottom of 236 now. They're ogres, she had said, laughing grimly. An ogre would have interfered, perhaps, with breakfast in bed, with walks at dawn down to the river. Um, so men are ogres. So there's this clear sense that these women do not want men in their lives. And that marriage to a man would involve not, um, not making life more beautiful, but rather sort of sucking the beauty out of life. 
also um, a marriage to a man would interfere with these walks down to the river. It would interfere with breakfast in bed. Um, she couldn't. She couldn't have these things with a man. Which of course, like, one can have in a marriage with a man, but um, that's not what either of these women are looking for. I also really like what she says about the crocuses. Um, when she visits Hampton Court the week the crocuses were at their best, um, she says it was something that lasted, something that mattered forever. And there's an irony to that, right? Because crocuses are a flower that blooms at the very beginning of spring, and they don't last forever. They actually don't last very long at all. They're something that you kind of have to, I mean, even as she says, like you have to kind of get there the week they bloom in order to see them. Um, it's a very like fleeting type of beauty. But um, I think what matters forever is not the crocus itself or like the individual crocuses, but rather the knowledge that the crocuses will always um, come back every spring. And again, there's also that symbolism of the flower as something that's like quintessentially feminine and beautiful um, and yonic. Um, so the flower for her is definitely like this kind of symbol of desire for a woman. Um, and so, finally, near the end of the story, on 237, Fanny sees the pin and she picks it up. So a lot has happened in the time between her dropping this pin and picking up the pin. Um, was Miss Cray so lonely? No. Miss Cray was steadily, blissfully, if only for that moment, a happy woman. Fanny had surprised her in a moment of ecstasy. She sat there, half turned away from the piano, with her hands clasped in her lap, holding the carnation upright, while behind her was the sharp square of the window, uncurtained, purple in the evening, intensely purple, after the brilliant electric lights which burned unshaded in the bare music room. Julia Cray, sitting hunched and compact, holding her flower, seemed to emerge of the London night seemed to fling it like a cloak behind her, it seemed, in its bareness and intensity, the affluence of her spirit, something she had made, which surrounded her. Fanny stared. Um, all seemed transparent for a moment to the gaze of Fanny Wilmot, as if looking through Miss Cray, she saw the very fountain of her being spurting its pure silver drops. She saw back and back into the past behind her. Um, so even though all of these things are Fanny's, like, invented ideas about Julia, um, Julia sees herself kind of as having this clear vision, or sorry, Fanny sees herself as having this very clear vision of, like, Julia's, like, the, the core and truth and, like, quintessential nature of Julia's being in a way that is, um, I think, very, like, easy to associate with her as having like romantic feelings toward her, right? Um, she saw Julia. And then finally at the end, Julia blazed, Julia kindled. Out of the night she burnt like a dead white star. So Julia is now on fire in um, Fanny's perception of her. And that is clearly, like, a vision of desire, right? Um, we have, like, burning and fire have always been um, symbols of sexual desire in literature. And so, um, Julia opened her arms, Julia kissed her on the lips, Julia possessed it. <coughs> So finally, the story ends with a sort of culmination of, um, can y'all not really stop it? Sorry, my cat's really good about to have a fight, but it's still going in the way. Um, so this moment of like desire being culminated. No. Other way. <laughs> 
um, in a kiss. And as we have our footnote that tells us too, number three, in the 1928 version, this paragraph reads, um, Julia kissed her, Julia possessed her. So actually like a lot more erotic in the first version of the story, Julia is able to possess Fanny herself in this way that is um, clearly like erotically phrased. Um, but instead in this new version, Julia possessed it, which I wonder what it is. I don't know, maybe like the, like whatever, like erotic, draw or power she has, um, maybe the kiss itself, but the use of it definitely makes it less like explicitly um, sexual. And keep in mind too, right, that like Wolf was writing at a time when it was difficult to write about female desire at all, let alone like lesbian female desire. And then it ends. Slater's pins have no points, Miss Cray said, laughing queerly and relaxing her arms, as Fanny will not pinned the flower to her breast with trembling fingers. Um, so Fanny has clearly been affected by this kiss. Um, oh, and I also wanted to say, um, Julia possessed it. Another thing that it could mean would be beauty itself, um, because Fanny has kind of had this thought process throughout the story that um, beauty is something, like, very difficult to possess, right? So, um, Julia can't possess it, even though she's holding and, like, um, kind of, like, even crushing the carnation in her hand, she can't possess it. Um, so perhaps this is finally the moment where it can be possessed. Okay, um, so let's see. So... Susan Clemens, in the article that I mentioned, calls this story, quote, a study of the forces through which lesbians come to misrecognize their sexual identity, um, which I think is <clears throat> a really interesting reading of it and, like, true also, right? So, again, we see Fanny, like, unable to recognize what she's feeling. Um, and because we have a stream of consciousness narrator, Fanny, um, we know that we have access to like her full range of thoughts and emotions and so that also tells us that she is so repressed in those thoughts and emotions that she cannot personally recognize like what is going on for her and like how she's experiencing this desire for her teacher even though for the reader it's like reasonably obvious um, so um, she also says in that article. In her creative capacity, Fanny can be seen as a storyteller who, through the muteness of her own tradition and the sway of another, is forced to overcode the events of her tale with a socially acceptable veneer. Um, so that's a somewhat difficult thing to unpack, but I want to talk about it a little bit because Fanny is telling us this story. This is her, her mind. And because she has no tradition before her through which to view um, same-sex female desire, she can't actually interpret her own experiences properly, which I think is really important um, just to modernism generally. Um, so I think we've talked a little bit, yeah, I have talked about this with this class. So like Eliot's tradition and the individual talent was about how male modernist authors had the difficulty of like casting aside and wrestling with their literary forefathers because they had this tradition of men going back to antiquity that they needed to, like if they wanted to make something new and like totally change literature, they had to somehow grapple with that very long tradition of men. Um, and for women, there was also a tradition, which Wolf says in Professions for Women, right? Like there was definitely a literary tradition for women by the time modernism existed. It wasn't as robust as the literary tradition for men. And women looked to that tradition not so much to like, you know, um, to like kill their idols or anything, but rather as inspiration and as the, the example that women like could do this, women could be writers. But for women who were lesbians, which 
Virginia Woolf was, um, there was really no literary tradition to go off of. Like they had no stories to um, to act as models, to help them interpret their own desire. So this is an example of how Fanny, someone who has never had um, you know, any like clear sense of what it would mean to be a lesbian, because there was nothing about that in, the, in culture or in literature, because of that she's unable to understand her desire for her teacher. So her moment of most understanding comes when she's um, after the kiss when her fingers are trembling as she pins the flower back. Um, let's see. So I think So I guess the last thing I want to mention, which I should have said in the beginning, but the last note I have that I think I haven't um, talked about, um, is that Fanny experiences both emotional and sexual awakening throughout the story, beginning with her realization that Julia shops for pins. So the beginning of the story is Fanny realizing that her music teacher is not actually fully knowable to her. She's like a separate person who she can't necessarily understand, whose life is, you know, as any other person's life is, whose life is unknowable to her. Um, and so, um, It's interesting then that at the very end of the story, um, she sees herself as able to know everything about um, Julia. So she goes from this moment of revelation that Julia can't be known to this feeling that she actually has a vision back into her past. Um, so her awakening coincides with her ability to know her teacher. And then we see her physically knowing her as well um, when Julia kisses her. Um, so I think we did go over this life without a man in this story is continuously portrayed as a life of freedom. And I did mention, right, that the pin deflowers Fanny. So those two central, like, phallic and yonic symbols of the story, the pin and the flower. Um, so although the pin literally deflowers her by falling off, um, it also has no point. So there's this idea that, like, the phallic symbol here is ineffective and useless and, like, can't, um, can't, like, continuously penetrate the flower in this way, so it's kind of this, like, double meaning of symbolism that I think is kind of interesting. Um, okay, so I think that's probably everything for this story, um, and we're going to do the death of the moth next time, but I think, you know, reading this story in light of Virginia Woolf's sense that she had no clear way to write about feminine erotic desire, um, I think that's kind of like a really important lens to read the story, right? So Wolf says in Professions for Women that she can't write about sensations of the body and the physical and specifically erotic. Um, and this story shows her um, writing about a repressed character because the only way for her to write about lesbian desire is to write about someone who is um, essentially repressing that desire and unable to even fully recognize that desire um, for what it is until perhaps at the end there's a moment of recognition with with the kiss and the sense that she fully does know Julia. Okay, um, so I hope that kind of uh, illuminates this story for you guys a little bit. Um, I'm going to put up a discussion for you to participate in about this and um, I will talk to you about the death of the moth next time. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the discussion, and I hope you're all well, staying safe, staying inside, and um, yeah.